in, in this lecture, we're going to talk about uh, different uh, components of atomic um, spectrometers. I think you already well know that uh, there are different types of atomic uh, spectrometers based on their mode of operation. I think we've already talked about AAS, for example, which is based on uh, absorption um, spectrometric uh, kind of mode. You know, you can also have emission um, spectr uh, atomic uh, spectroscopy, and with that Mission atomic spectroscopy, you know, you can also have uh, fluorescence, which is sort of a type of an emission spectrometer. Um, although, although it's not very, very common, you know, with atomic spectroscopy, you know, it's more common with molecular spectroscopy. But I'm going to give you one example, at least, you know, of an element, you know, that tends to undergo fluorescence, although that's not very common. Only one element, which is typically mercury. But the other elements typically do not undergo fluorescence. So, in essence, you've got only really one commercial type of uh, atomic spectrometer that is based on fluorescence, and that is a mercury detection system. Now, it's not very common, you know, to do flu uh, phosphorescence, you know, because of the reasons that I gave you before. If you look at the Jablowski diagram, that for you to do phosphorescence, you need to um, have intersystem crossing happening, and that's not very, very common, uh, you know, with, uh, with elements. So I would say the two most common type of um, atomic spectrometers, of course, would be the absorption, you know, which you guys have done in the lab, you know, the AAS, but you can also do emission spectrometry, um, you know, which is uh, AES, Atomic Emission Spectrometer, and with fluorescence, you know, you can have a mercury detection system. So it's very important, you know, to remember the components of these uh, types of spectrometers, you know, but also remember the configuration. For example, when you're doing absorption spectrometer, typically that is a configuration where the light source, you know, it's in line with the detector, when you're doing uh, atomic emission spectrometer, this is a configuration here where the source, you know, is at right angles, you know, to the detector. Now, of course, you know, well, there are many applications, you know, of atomic spectrometers, be it uh, AES or AAS, which is principally, you know, ability to analyze different types of elements in different types of matrices. You guys already did the uh, determination of copper in beer using AAS. You also determine different composition of uh, metals in brass, for example, you know, which is an alloy. You can also, you know, do detection of metals in engine oil, used engine oil, very, very common um, type of uh, way of determining, um, you, you know, how well your engine is running just by looking, you know, at uh, the heavy metals that are present in the aging oil. You know, you can look at, you know, different types of nutrients, you know, in soil, in fertilizers, in foods. But the key is, of course, you are dealing with elements in this case. Now, for the sake of your exams and so on, for you to really understand what's going on, you can be asked a question, you know, such as this, you know, design an instrument, possibly, you know, for field applications, you know, which is very, very high, highly sensitive. And uh, so make sure you determine, you know, which choice of component do you actually use, you know, to build your system. And that is really the purpose of this lecture, to understand why do you use each particular component, you know, that you integrate into your atomic uh, spectrometer. Because who knows, of course, some of you may end up being hired, you know, by instrument manufacturers, and you'll be able to, you, you will need to understand, you know, the basis of every component uh, that is typically used. So with atomic spectroscopies, of course, you know, you need a component or a way to introduce your sample into the system. And as simple as it sounds, it very, very highly impacts your sensitivity. You know, so the method of sample introduction that you use, you know, highly impacts your sensitivity. But also, of course, it impacts, you know, things like uh, the sample throughput. You know, how many samples 
uh, you know, can you run, you know, in a minute, you know, again, uh, the sample introduction technique, you know, determines, you know, sample throughput, you know, how rapid, you know, can you run uh, the types of uh, samples that you have. Equally, the type of sample introduction method you choose determine whether you can uh, simply run a solution or you can actually run a solid sample, meaning you don't need to prepare the sample for analysis, which helps you in terms of saving cost, saving time, and so on. Now, I'm going to list, you know, uh, maybe eight different um, sample introduction methods, you know, and, 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 and of course, for the sake of exams, it's important for you to be able to list them and explain, you know, how they work. Now, one type of, um, you know, sample introduction method, maybe the most common is what you refer to as a pneumatic nebulization, and it can be used to introduce solutions, you know, as well as slurries, you know, as samples. Now, this is what you guys did in the lab, actually. You, with the AAS, you did pneumatic nebulization, and as the name suggests, pneumatic simply means pressure. You know, so essentially, you're pressurizing, you know, your sample solution, you know, through the system. Now, another method, you know, that you can use is what you refer to as ultrasonic nebulization. And this is a process, you know, by which you can introduce a solution and the solution impedes or heats a crystal that is vibrating. And because a crystal is vibrating, you know, the solution splits into a mist. Because ideally, you know, you want the sample to actually be converted, you know, into a mist, you know, that is transferred, you know, into your atomizer. And I'm going to show you that in a later slide. Another type of, you know, sample introduction method is a furnace, so or what you refer to as electrothermal vaporization. And that is where you just simply have a furnace, a very small furnace, actually, very similar to a GC uh, injection pot. And then you have, um, you can introduce your solution, you can introduce even a liquid or even a solid, you know, can actually be used, you know, when uh, you are using a furnace on electrothermal vaporization technique. Now, the other type of method of sample introduction is hydride generation, and I'm going to talk about it later on. But typically, you use it, you know, for very specific types of elements. So it's very, very selective for hydride generating type of elements. And I'm going to show you, you know, how to do that. Other methods, you know, include, you know, direct insertion, you know, where you just simply take the sample and somehow, you know, you introduce it, you know, to the atomizer, you know, uh, maybe using even a spatula, you know, and so forth. And of course, you can see that you can analyze, you know, solids or powders, you know, using that type of method. Another method is laser ablation, you know, where typically you use a laser. And remember, you know, how the laser is made. I think I described that previously when we are talking about... Um, different types of light sources and laser of course stands for light amplification stimulated emission uh, radiation so it's an acronym actually so it's very very energetic meaning if at all you've got a sample maybe you put it on a glass slide you shine a laser on that glass slide you know you get you know the sample being ablated you know to the to the atomizer and of course you can see with a laser ablation you know, you can analyze solids samples as well, which is very good because you don't need, you know, to do dissolution, which takes a lot of time in the lab. Maybe the last type of, you know, technique I'm going to mention is a glow discharge sputtering, you know, which is actually a, a lamp. And I'm going to show you a slide later on on this, where you just take an electrode, you know, and you put your sample onto an electrode and then you expose it to a fast atom uh, moving beam and it causes the sputtering or ablation of your analyte and um, you know it goes to the to, to the to, to the to the atomizer so with a pneumatic type of nebulization you know you can use four different uh, types of or even five different types of pneumatic nebulizers 
And as you can see, each one of these, you know, can be fairly resistant to clogging because one big problem, you know, we have with nebulization is clogging. Clogging meaning, you know, if at all you've got dissolved solids in solution, you know, they tend, you know, to clog, you know, the orifice, you know, that is being used, um, you know, for the nebulization. But some of these, you know, pneumatic nebulizers, as you can see, possibly, you know, um, they've got different resistances, you know, to the clogging effect. So one type of pneumatic nebulizer is what you call the high pressure gas flow. You know, where you've got a pump, you know, and the pump is pushing the solution, you know, through a tube. And then you've got a uh, gas, you know, that is moving around that tube. And because of that, you know, you get, um, you know, nebulization or the spray uh, of that solution into a mist. And in fact, you know, what, what you refer to this really is what you call, I think, the Bernoulli effect. You know, the Bernoulli effect, you know, where you've got, you know, um, a high pressure gas, you know, revolving around a concentric tube. And because of that, you know, you get um, a suction, you know, taking place. So in actual fact, in this case, you don't really need a pump. Now, another type of, um, you know, nebulization technique, pneumatic nebulizer, is where you've got, um, uh, is what you call the cross flow. And the cross flow is where you've got the sample, and the sample is being pumped using a pump, and then you've got a high pressurized gas, uh, you know, uh, uh, colliding, you know, with that solution. And of course, you can see that you end up, you know, with a plume or a mist, you know, that goes to the, that goes to the atomizer. And ideally, of course, you know, the finer the mist, you know, the better the atomization will be. So ideally, nebulization, we are looking to convert, you know, the droplets. We are looking to convert the droplets, really, into a mist. That, that, that's what we are looking to do with nebulization. Now, the third type of pneumatic nebulizer here is what you recall, refer to as a fritted disc. And as the name suggests, you know, you've got uh, the high pressure gas, you know, that is going through a frit. And a frit, you know, is just um, a material, you know, that is porous. And then you've got the sample, you know, that is being pumped, you know, uh, across that frit, and as you can imagine, there's a collision, you know, between the high pressure gas and the solution flow, and of course, you get a mist, you know, as well. Now, lastly, you know, you've got the Barbington, uh, the Barbington type of pneumatic nebulizer, where essentially you've got a ball or something that looks like a balloon, and you've got the high pressure gas, you know, going through the balloon, and then you just prick the balloon make a small hole, and as you can see, of course, you know, the, you know, the, the, the gas sort of, you know, makes a plume, and you've got the sample, you know, that is dropping or rolling, you know, on the balloon or on the ball, and as it gets to the orifice, you know, it gets pushed out and split into a mist. So you can see all those are examples of different types of uh, pneumatic uh, nebulizers. And as you can see, really, the Barbington, you know, is the most resistant uh, to clogging. Now, in our list, you know, of different sample introduction methods, th there is always a desire to multiplex, you know, um, or, or have a system that performs more than one purpose. So if you are able, you know, to have a system, you know, that is able to introduce a sample, and yet the same system is doing the atomization, you know, breaking, you know, the mist into its component atoms, then, you know, you've got a fairly better system because you can miniaturize, you know, your instrument. And one example, you know, of a system that can actually do both sample introduction and atomization is what you refer to as a glow discharge. And this slide or this picture, you know, shows you um, a picture of, um, you know, the glow discharge lamp. Really, it's a lamp. And all what it is, is you've got a cathode. 
and in the cathode, you know, you coat it in the cathode, you know, you coat it, you know, with a sample of interest. And then you introduce, you know, this cathode coated with a sample of in interest and you introduce it into a chamber, you know, that is pressurized, you know, containing argon gas at a pressure of around, you know, 10 uh, tall. And now, if at all you've got this sample in a cathode, you can simply short circuit it, if at all it positively uh, the, the, the cathode is uh, negatively charged, and then you've got an anode, you, you know, which is positively charged. If you bring it into um, into connection, you, you know, you momentarily bring the two electrodes into contact. Essentially, you know, you'll be short circuiting, you know, the system. And as you short circuit the system, of course, you guys know that that causes a spark, you, you know, to happen. And if at all there is a spark, you know, you get the sputtering, you, you know, you get the sputtering really of this, um, of the sample, you know, that is coated and it, it gets sputtered and, um, you, you know, you can cause atomization that way, all right? Now, another way that you can actually operate this system, you know, equally is by applying a voltage, you know, on this gas that is inside. And when you apply a voltage, say, on the anode, uh, it can cause, um, you know, the ionization of the gas, or the argon gas. And so the argon gas, you know, is ionized, you know, to make the argon cations. And the argon cations, you know, can be accelerated, you know, to the negatively uh, charged cathode, you know, and that causes the sputtering the sputtering effect, you know, is really what they call the first atom bombardment, you know, and you got the argon gas, you know, that is ionized and is being accelerated to the negatively charged cathode, and then there is an impeachment, and that impeachment, you know, causes uh, the ablation of your material uh, as well. So, so you can see it's a combination, you know, of sample introduction, you know, but also atomization. Now, of course, whatever is atomized, you know, can be detected either by atomic absorption, it can also be detected by atomic fluorescence, or it can be detected, you know, by atomic um, uh, mass spectrometer. So other type of specialized techniques, um, you know, that again combine atomization and sample introduction methods, well, at the same time, being very good, you know, for the analysis of solid samples, meaning you don't need to dissolve the sample, includes, you know, the glow discharge, which I've talked about, you know, in the previous slide. But you can also use a furnace. And as I said before, you know, the furnace really is just um, um, a, a metallic container, you know, that is electrically heated, you know, using a voltage and where the sample is there, you know, it gets uh, vaporized um, and an atomized uh, as well. So you can see, you can use it, you know, for solids, liquids, slurries, and so forth. Arc and spark ablation, you know, very similar, you know, to the glow discharge. The only difference, you know, is where you take the two electrodes, you know, the cathode, and then you've got the anode. And then you momentarily, you know, bring them, you know, into contact and the sample, you know, is on the cathode, for example, and you get, you know, the sparking. So it's similar to what I explained before, only that it's operating based on the short circuiting uh, system. Now, the other type of uh, atomizer, you know, that combines um, sample introduction and atomization is what you refer to as a laser ablation. And I think I explained it before, you know, you just put the sample, you know, on a, on, on a platform and you shine the laser and the laser causes, you know, the ablation and the atomization of your, of your analyte. Another very specialized, you know, type of atomizer um, and equally, you know, it can work as a sample introduction method is what you refer to as hydride generation technique. This one is very, very specific, you know, for certain types of elements, you know, that react with 
uh, sodium borohydride in the presence of an acid, you know, to create uh, volatile hydrides. And volatile hydrides, you know, they've got fairly low vapor pressure. Rather, sorry, they've got fairly high vapor pressure, meaning that, you know, they are fairly volatile. And because they are fairly volatile, you know, they can just simply, after the reaction, you know, they tend to be in the vapor phase. And you can sweep them, you know, using an argon gas. And then you can take them, you know, to, uh, to, 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 to the atomizer or to the, to the detector, you know, and so on. So, so, so you can see this technique, you know, tends to be very, very selective and very, very selective, you know, for arsenic, antimony, things like tin, bismuth, and lead, which are the six, you know, types of uh, elements uh, that tend to form uh, hydrides, you know, when you do the, the, the reaction with sodium borohydride in the presence of, uh, of an acid. And you can see the limits of detection are fairly low, uh, that is 10 to 200, um, uh, they, they are increased 10 to, to, to 100 uh, because of the fact that it's a very selective system. So you can see matrices really, you know, tends to be less of a problem here because you are dealing with a fairly selective uh, type of technique. Another method of sample introduction, you know, that is fairly specialized, you know, is what you refer to as a cold vapor atomization technique and this one is only very selective uh, for mercury now mercury you know we all know is a very unique type of metal you know because it's uh, fairly volatile it's got a fairly low uh, vapor high vapor pressure and because of that you know if you put you know the sample containing uh, mercury in a, in, in, in a volumetric flask for example and then you've got argon gas, you know, that is aerating the sample. The argon is going to carry, you know, the mercury vapor, you know, into, um, into, in, into um, the, the, the detection system, you know, and so on. Of course, if at all you're dealing with atomic emission spectrometer, of course, you need to heat up you know, the system, you know, so that the mercury vapor, you know, get excited. It gets excited and it relaxes, you know, to give you fluorescence, okay? And so you can see very, very specific technique, you know, to uh, mercury. And, and so if at all I give you a sample, you know, maybe it's a water sample, uh, often, you know, mercury would be present, you know, in form of, uh, in form of iron. So you need to take that sample and reduce those ions or cations, you reduce them. Um, you, you know, into into the metal, and then after that, you know, you can, um, you, you know, sweep it using an argon gas, you know, into the atomizer, if at all you're dealing with an uh, AES system. Now, you can see with the cold vapor atomic fluorescence system, which is the only commercial technique, actually, you know, for, uh, at, for atoms, you, you know, you can have detection limits of up to one picogram. And the, again, it's only commercial, you know, for mercury, you know, because mercury has got a fairly, um, you, you know, high vapor pressure uh, and so on. So, so let us quickly discuss, you know, the theory, you know, behind, you know, atomization or what is actually taking place. You know, as I explained before, you know, typically you've got a sample and, and often it's a solution. Of course, you can also do liquids, as I have said. And then you nebulize it using the different types of nebulization, pneumatic nebulization techniques, you know, that I talked about. And with nebulization, you're converting, you know, the solution into a spray or into a mist. So the next step, you know, is you push this mist, you know, into the atomizer. And in the atomizer, all these steps, you know, are actually taking place. The very first step, you know, that happens in the atomizer is to get rid of the liquid using the process referred to as dissolvation. Meaning you're going to get, you know, your sample, you know, and then you remove in a solvent, you know, that is present, essentially, you know, through vaporization, right? 
And so after that, you're going to get now the molecule, you know, in solid form. You know, the next step, you know, is what you refer to as, you know, volatilization, where you take, you know, now the molecule, you know, that is in solid form, of course, it's in very, very tiny particles, you know, and then you convert it, you know, into gas, of course, using very high temperatures. Now, after you have now the molecule in gas form, the next step is what you refer to as dissociation, where now you atomize or break down, you know, those molecules into the component atoms, you know, which are, you know, in gaseous form. If at all you are interested, you know, with ionization, assume your detector is a mass spectrometer, other things, you know, can equally happen, such as ionization. However, if at all you are doing AAS, ideally you want the process to stop at dissociation. If at all you are doing AES, again, uh, you largely want uh, the process, you know, to stop, you know, at uh, dissociation. You do not want ionization to happen. However, you know, if at all the detection system is a mass pack, you know, then you want ionization, you know, to take place. And this can equally happen, you know, inside the atomizer. So there's a balancing act, really, you know, between, you know, having the temperature hot enough to cause ionization, which can be a good thing with the mass spec. But if at all you don't have a mass spec and you just have an AES system, Essentially, you don't want ionization. If ionization takes place, this one is a matrix effects problem. So let us talk very, very quickly, you know, about the different types of atomizers, you know, that are used. You guys in the lab already are familiar with the flame. And, you know, there are different uh, types of uh, gases that you can use to make the flame. And de depending on the type of gas that you use, you can have different types of temperatures. Ideally, of course, you know, you are looking for the hottest temperature possible. If you guys in the lab, remember in the lab, you used acetylene and the air, you know, as your as your gases, and so that was your temperature profile. As you can see, you know, the temperatures are not too high, and as such, you know, um, uh, flames are typically used, uh, you know, with AAS system, okay? Because a flame is not hot enough, you know, to really cause um, excitation and an emission for you to do AES, so with the flame, you typically just do uh, the atomic absorption spectrometer because the flame is just good enough, really, you know, to cause, uh, to cause atomization. Another better system, you know, that you can use is, is what you refer to as a graphite furnace, atomic graphite furnace, you know, spectrometer. And this is where you use the electrothermal vaporization, you know, as your atomizer. The good thing with this system, you know, is the fact that, you know, the furnace is very, very small. And again, you know, you can just deposit a very small amount of sample, you know, into the furnace, which sometimes can even be one microliter. Remember, when you guys did the flame AA, remember, you know, it is very, very wasteful. You, you know, of the sample. If you remember, you are using something like 10 mils of sample, you know, per minute, you know, so it's a very wasteful method. But with a graphite furnace, uh, atomic uh, spectrometer, you use um, a, a very, very tiny little furnace. And so, you know, you can use a very small amount of the sample. And so the steps, you know, with the graphite furnace is, you know, you deposit the sample and then you evaporate the solvent, you know, just by ramping up the temperature. So it operates very similar, really, to a gas chromatography. So you, um, you, you increase the temperature to around 100 degrees, you know, which is uh, the boiling point of water. And that way you vaporize, you know, the solvent. And then after that, you can increase the temperature to around 1500 degrees centigrade. 
and that way you break down any organic matter that is present in the sample and then after that you know you can now atomize your sample by ramping up the temperature you know to 3000 degrees centigrade so you can see you know with this system you know you are able actually to remove some of the matrices that can be present in the samples so is a better technique obviously because you can improve you know the limits of detection by removing uh, the different types of matrices that are present so very quickly you know if you can compare between the flame aa and the electrothermal and that is a graphite furnace sometimes we'll call it a graphite uh, furnace uh, aa so again, you can see the different uh, benefits, you know, say so the flame, the precision is very good with the flame and, um, you, you know, it tends to be fairly fast as well, but it's got fairly low limits of detection. It's not very, very sensitive. On the other hand, you know, with the electrothermal type of vaporization, you know, you can use very small amounts of sample, which is a very good thing. It is fairly sensitive compared to the flame. You know, um, unfortunately, you know, you get poor precision, you know, because of the different types of steps that I talked about. Uh, and the fact that, you know, you are depositing very small amounts of sample. Anytime you use very small amounts of sample, the standard deviation, you know, of that sample um, volume, you know, is fairly high. And that impacts, you know, your precision. So electrothermal vaporization is not as precise, you know, compared, you know, to the flame. And also the technique tends to be slower because of the fact that, you know, you are doing this multi-step, you know, temperature gradient uh, increase. And of course that increases the amount of time um, that you use to run each sample. So... There are a couple of issues, you know, that you face when you are doing a spectroscopy, particularly atomic, you know, spectroscopy. Now, remember, the, the very first component that we've been talking a lot about, you know, is a light source. And as you guys well know, the typical light source that you use with atomic absorption spectroscopy is actually the hollow cathode lamp, you know, which typically looks like that. Now, I already explained before how the hollow cathode lamp, which is a line source, I said it's just simply a cathode, you know, that is coated with the mirror of interest and is put inside, you know, a pressurized um, inert uh, gas uh, chamber and uh, the gas uh, is ionized, you know, to produce the argon cations, you know, which are sputter, which are accelerated to the cathode containing the sample and you get the sputtering effect and the excitation of, um, you know, the element and then it relaxes back, you know, to give you, you know, the lines uh, or the light, you know, um, that, that, that you are interested in. The light that you get, you know, from a hollow cathode lamp is a line source, you know, meaning, you know, it's got a very, very small or well-defined discrete peak, you know, at a certain wavelength. Unfortunately, though this is the this is the good thing, as this light transitions, you know, into the atomizer, unfortunately, it starts to broaden. And when it's broadening, you know, it uh, affects, you know, the fact that um, if it's broadening, you know, it's affecting, um, you, you know, the, the, the detection, you know, in the end, you know, the, the, the limit of detection gets impacted, you know, because of, uh, the line source, you know, being broadened as it's transitioning, you know, uh, from the atomizer, you know, to the detector. And as it's being broadened, you know, uh, it, it affects, of course, you know, the limit, um, the, the, the limit of detection. So the question is, you know, why does broadening happen? And what can you do about minimizing the broadening effect? you know, of the light source, you know, which ideally, you know, should be completely monochromatic and it, which otherwise, you know, if you don't do anything about it, as I said, you know, it impacts, you know, your limits of detection. As you can see from my image here, you know, so initially from the light source, you know, the hollow cathode lamp, you've got very nicely defined peaks. 
as it's transitioning and being absorbed, you know, in the atomizer, you know, it starts uh, to broaden. So the question is, why do you get the broadening effect? And the broadening effect, you know, is largely because of three factors, you know, that are at play, which I think some of which you've come across, you know, in uh, the chemistry 102. Now, one factor that is happening is what you refer to as a Heisenberg, you know, uncertainty principle, meaning that it's fairly difficult, you know, to determine, uh, to determine uh, the position of an electron as it's transitioning, you know, from um, an excited state, you know, to, uh, to the ground state. You know, so you cannot really, you know, uh, determine, you know, the exact, you know, position, you know, of an electron. And because you are dealing really, you know, with, um, with, 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 with high temperature environments, you know, essentially you're gonna get, you know, excitation, you know, um, you, you, you know, of your atoms and, and, and so on. And so Heisenberg uncertainty principle is one factor, you know, that actually impacts, you know, um, impacts, um, you know, the line source and causes, you know, band broadening. Another factor, you know, that causes uh, line broadening is what you call the Doppler effect. And the Doppler effect, you know, largely means uh, the fact that if at all you've got, you know, molecule or an atom, an atom in the flame. And because the flame, you know, is fairly, um, uh, is fairly violent, you know, these uh, atom, you know, can be moving in different kinds of directions. Okay. You've got the detector right here. Okay, and so you can have some atoms, you know, moving, you know, towards the detector, whereas other atoms are moving, you know, away from the detector. And also you've got, you know, the light source here. You've got, you know, some atoms, you know, that are moving, you know, towards the light source, you know, and others are receding away from the light source. And because of that, you know, the atoms that are going towards the light source are gonna experience higher frequencies, you know, compared to those that are receding, you know, from the light source. Similarly, you know, with the detector, it is the same thing. Um, you, you know, if at all you've got uh, atoms that are going towards the detector, again, you know, you get some differential frequency perturbation, you know, that is taking place. And because of that, you know, you actually get the so-called, you know, Doppler effect uh, happening. Now, the last type of broadening uh, um, effect, you know, from the broadening is what you refer to as, you know, pressure broadening. Now, if you think about it, you know, in the flame, you know, you would have a lot of atoms, you know, that are present. And as light, you know, is impeding these atoms, you know, these atoms are equally you know, colliding as well. And because of that, you know, you, you create, you know, a pressure region, um, you know, because of these uh, violent, you know, nature, you know, of the atoms. And because of that, you know, there's a broadening effect, you know, um, uh, of, of, of the light source. Again, because, you know, these, because of the kinetic energies, you know, of the atoms, you know, that are different, you know, within the flame. I hope it's fairly clear, you know, that within the flame, typically, you know, you've got atoms that are moving and they've got different kinetic energies. And because of that, you know, when the light source is impeding those, um, you know, atoms that have got different kinetic energies, you, you know, the absorption of that light actually is going to be fairly different and there. And as such, you know, there will be a broadening, there will be a broadening, broadening effect. So hopefully it's fairly clear, you know, again, you know, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle is one cause of band broadening. You know, the Doppler effect, you know, is another cause of band broadening, again, because of differential movement, you know, of the atoms towards the detector or towards, you know, the... Uh, the light source, and also the pressure effect, you know, because of the kinetic energies 
um, that are different, you know, depending on uh, the speed of the atoms and as such, they're going to impede, um, you know, the light uh, using, um, at, a different, at a different frequency. And because of that, you get uh, the, the, the band broadening. Now, there's a fourth one that I'm going to talk about it a little later. You know, there's also what you refer to as a Zeeman effect, you know, which is also another cause of band broadening. And this is often common if at all there's an electric field, you know, um, that is close, you know, to the light source. If at all you've got a line source and you put a, an electric field or even a magnet, you know, fairly close to it, it tends to split, you know, into, um, into, into other wavelengths. And that is what you refer to as the Zeeman, the Zeeman effect. So in the next chapter, we, we, we're going to talk about what we can do, you know, to correct other problems that are taking place, you know, within uh, the spectrometer, particularly, you know, you've got the flame, in the flame, you know, typically you've got, you know, smoke that is present and so on. There are particles, you know, that are present. If at all, again, you've got um, a, a furnace, you know, and you're ashing something, you know, in the furnace. Again, you've got a lot of, uh, you, you know, dust particles or smoke, you know, that is present. And again, that can really affect uh, the limits of detection. If at all you've got equally a plasma, you know, you've got the very strong light, you know, that is coming from the plasma. And again, if it ends up in the detector, you know, that impacts um, your background signal, you know. So again, how do you correct, you know, for some of these background effects that really degrade, you know, your signal to noise? So in the next lecture, you know, you're going to talk about the different components, you know, that you can integrate within the atomic spectrometers, you know, so that you can correct, you know, for these uh, problems of background effects.